Yeah, so thank you, Ash, and the other organizers. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I think that um, I've heard that attention is correlated with novelty. So I think this will be a gripping talk um, because it is a little different from the other talks you've seen in a variety of ways. Um, so the goal of the project that I'm going to be telling you about is this one. Right, so we're going to be looking at something called inspiratory bursts um, in the respiratory brainstem. And this is a mammalian um, topic, I would say. Um, I don't know anything about breathing in the fly, and, and I therefore won't say anything about that. Um, and so I have a very bold conjecture to start with. Uh, and this fits into the framework of connectomics, even though it, I think it's a quite a different scale than what we've seen. Um, I looked up the definition of connectome before my talk just to make sure I wasn't hallucinating, and, and it is pretty general and broad, um, so I think we're good. Um, so to orient you, um, assuming you're not familiar with this, although Ash knew the pre-bots, uh, so we're talking about a region down in the brainstem of the mammalian brain, and uh, from my perspective, um, this is a useful cartoon to get oriented. So we have a variety of different brain regions um, that we're talking about that interact to produce respiration and to modulate respiration, like when you need to speak or cough and these types of things. And the really star of this story um, is this pre-Botzinger complex area here um, situated in the brainstem. Okay, so uh, the sub-goals, I want to break this down into some pieces. Um, and this is not, again, this is the goal of the whole project. Um, not necessarily this talk, um, would be sort of divided into a couple of different levels. Right? There's the contributions of ion currents and other biophysical factors to the bursting patterns that the neurons are generating. And already this is a little different. We haven't really been talking about this sort of thing here. Uh, and then there's the connectivity within the prebots, um, this, this cer yellow circled region um, that's responsible for the inspiratory part of the respiratory rhythm um, that's also going to play an important role. And then, of course, um, we'd like to put these two together. All right, so I want to start with a few key experimental observations uh, so that you know what it is that I'm trying to capture uh, in the modeling and analysis here. Okay, so um, when you think about respiration, you may just think two phases, right? You breathe in, breathe out. But technically, under the hood, it's a three-phase rhythm. Okay, and so the experimentalists will record signals from various electrodes. So this is actual spiking signals in some cases, or extracellular recordings, so maybe capturing a little collection of units. Uh, and then there's a spike sorting process. And through that process, um, people have classified uh, the spiking patterns associated with respiration into various types. Okay, and so here are three of them, and these are sort of the key three that, that make up the classic three-phase respiratory pattern. So you have the inspiratory phase with this sort of ramping up or augmenting activity, and then there's an early decrementing phase of, of expiration, or sometimes called the post-I phase, and then a later sort of augmenting phase of expiration. And then despite the fact that this is building up, we have to somehow overcome that and go into the next inspiratory cycle. Okay? So those are the three phases. Okay. Um, now here's a nice schematic representation that in fact, you know, there are more than just three different patterns when you do this sorting. But again, you can kind of group them into this, uh, here's late expiration, uh, and here's inspiration, and there's sort of something in the middle. Okay, and what I'm going to be focusing on here is when this expiratory phase abruptly ends and the inspiratory phase comes on, right? So if we line up the end of this blue is like with the start of this red, and there's this key E to I transitional firing, right? And really this is... Um, going to be my focus here, right? So in, a, in the larger zoomed out project, you know, we want to understand not necessarily all of these details, 
but certainly how a network of respiratory neurons and what we know about how they're connected and their ion currents and all of these details produce this sort of three-phase rhythmicity. Um, but yeah, for today, let's, let's really focus on this. Okay, so the second thing besides the existence of these three phases that I want to highlight is what happens in this transition, right? this, e, this E to I transition. Okay, and so when you record from a bunch of cells relative to a motor nerve that sort of gives you a population readout from the pre-Botzinger complex shown up here, you see that in between the big motor output events that can drive the diaphragm, there's this sort of scattered firing, right? And so spikes gradually build up, build up, and then there's a burst where they align together. Uh, that's what makes it through to the motor neuron, and that's what drives the diaphragm, and then we go back into another cycle. Okay, and you can see there's um, analytically a distinction between these phases, even if you didn't have this motor neuron readout. You can see that there's a transition between a sort of weaker correlation among the spike times in these neurons in the ramping period, and then this tightening of the correlation that signifies, okay, now we're in the burst, all right? And then back in the interburst interval, the correlation spreads out again, okay? So that's the second effect, okay? And then the third aspect is that, in fact, this transition, even though it can initiate, it can actually be delayed or it can even fail. Okay, so here I have experiments from Jack Feldman's lab here at UCLA um, by Kai Wen Kam. And the idea here is that they looked at the firing activity in various uh, extracellular potassium concentrations. So this represents a sort of experimental way to manipulate um, something that might, mod that might actually vary um, internally with like development or uh, various uh, neuromodulatory conditions. And you can see um, at the level of the individual uh, neuron or unit recordings, some of these events, uh, sorry, this is actually integrated. So this is a, a collection of activity within the pre-Botzinger complex. Some of these events uh, have an overall much smaller amplitude and they fail to be translated into the output signal. Okay, so these are, have been dubbed burstlets, okay, and only some of these actually transition into full-fledged bursts that drive the motor signal. Okay. And um, initially, when the activity gets going into this ramp, you can't really tell which it's gonna be, right? You don't know, is it gonna be a full-fledged burst or is it gonna peter out and just remain a burstlet? Okay. So um, finally, they also showed that if a burst had just happened and they tried to initiate a subsequent burst um, by uncaging glutamate uh, in, the in the vicinity of just a few neurons, um, depending on the delay since the last burst and the number of uncaging spots, so the number of neurons um, excited, um, they could get um, either a failure or a success of evoking a burst uh, with various delays. Okay, so that's another, you know, this is the information we have, right? This is a clue, at least, about some properties of this circuit. Um, so to sum this up then, um, what we want to capture here is just the three-phase respiratory rhythm, including this ramping up transition um, from I to E, okay? And then um, the fact that this transition could, like the rhythmicity remains, but in the face of this rhythmicity, uh, some of these events can fail and others can really um, explode into full-fledged bursts, which, which get transmitted. Okay, so my claim is that uh, any model that uh, could really convincingly explain the mechanisms between, behind all of these observations would actually be a triumph, okay? So people have known about you know, the three-phase rhythm for decades, and there remains you know, massive controversy in this field about you know, what's going on behind this, uh, what's going on here, and, and um, now what's going on here. Okay, so, so there's really a need for a good model to come through and, and sort of 
at least propose some you know, plausible mechanisms that could bring all these phenomena into, into being. Okay, so that's in a sense what we're after. Um, so here's where we get into the connectomics a little bit. Okay, so um, there's a really interesting paper um, in a journal that I'm not very familiar with uh, that came out now quite a while ago that actually looked at um, where are these neurons uh, and what are the connections between them, okay? Now the thing is, remember the early image in my talk, right? This is the respiratory brainstem. Deep down in the brain, the, the, the favored model here is, a perf it's called a perfused in situ uh, mouse prep, okay? And so this is not a situation where, up until now anyway, anyone has managed to get in there and kind of do the type of imaging that I've been blown away to see in some of the talks at this meeting and actually sort of sketch out where are all these neurons and who's talking to who, right? So this is actually it as far as data of this type in this field. And what they did was they took out uh, the pre-Botzinger complex at some developmental stage and they cultured it and kind of, you know, made sure it stayed alive. And then they did this uh, just physical analysis of where are the neurons and where are the connections between them, okay? And what they got uh, was what I've heard referred to as um, a caveman network, right? So basically a collection of clusters, so caves with fairly dense connections within them and fairly sparse connections between them, okay? Um, so we can see these clusters imaged here and we can see uh, the statistics of you know, the distribution, okay, with a fairly coarse scale, but the numbers of neurons within each different cluster. And then there are these sort of outlier remnant neurons that aren't in any cluster, so you can see um, how many there were. Um, we also have, um, again, as I said, the dense connections within the cluster. Okay, so these are the numbers that they considered as dense, and then relatively sparse connections between the clusters. Okay, and one thing that I haven't said until now that may be relevant is we're talking about a few hundred neurons. Okay, so in the mouse, the pre-Botzinger complex, um, at least the inspiratory population, the, the, the neurons I care about here, um, I'm, I'm, a biologist could tell you more precisely. I'm just going to say it's on the order of, you know, hundreds of neurons, okay? Um, so these clusters obviously are not very big. Um, but this is a proposed um, topography of, you know, where the, what the, where the connections are in the pre-bots. Yes? So uh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think, they didn't really report anything about the dynamics and the culture. It's all about the connections. Um, yeah, very interesting. Um, yes? Sorry, when it says number of connections here, is this for any given cell within a cluster? It makes four yes. connections within Yes, that's a right. That's not the total number of connections in the cluster. That's per cell. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I look at this. And I think, okay, what does this network need to do? This network overall, not just one cluster, but the whole network needs to generate this nice synchronized burst so we can drive our diaphragm and get air. All right, so let's visualize this another way. So we took the statistics here and built our own networks that obeyed the statistics. Ah, let's skip that. Okay, um, and we get this diagram. Okay, now I am going to go back for a second just to give you a, a little, some guideposts to where I am in the talk. Okay, I gave you the goal of the project, and now I'm going to tell you about four directions, depending on time. Okay, and there's a spoiler here. Sorry for those of you who prefer cliffhangers, but the first thing that I'm going to tell you about is starting with the picture that I briefly flashed up. Okay, this caveman network there are no miracles here, okay? This is not gonna work. At least what we tried with this does not generate the respiratory rhythm, okay? And then I'm gonna tell you about another model where we said, okay, well, let's set that aside um, and let's focus on this burst lit to bursts. We got this to work. 
And then I'm going to come back to connectivity in the rest of the talk. Excuse me. Um, uh, and I'm going to do my best not to <laughs> knock anything over in the process. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is, um, in fact, we have some really fun individual neuron models um, where individual neurons could produce this ramping. So there's a whole alternative theory that's complementary to this work that says actually individual neurons could get this ramping going in a special way. I, I like these models a lot because they're fun from a dynamical systems point of view, but they don't fit in, in this workshop. So I won't talk about those. And I just wanted to mention, in case this is anybody's bread and butter, because this is actually closer to what we've seen so far, I do have some work done in collaboration with a psychiatrist where he has nice fMRI data from schizophrenics and healthy control subjects. And it's, um, we parcelate the brain into different regions uh, and use some maximum entropy models, which I kind of thought was something we would have heard a lot about and maybe fairly standard, but maybe not, um, to, to analyze this data. And we find some interesting distinctions between the schizophrenics and healthy controls. So that's just a little plug to say, if anyone's interested in that sort of thing, I would love to talk to you sometime during the week. OK, so anyway, back to our cavemen. Um, so this is actually a, one of my favorite figures. Um, this was generated by Chris Guiteri, who's now at SUNY Upstate, but was a uh, doing a rotation with me at the time, and then continued to work on this throughout his PhD, even on the side while he did his sort of real project with his advisor. Um, and so we built networks like this using these statistics from this Hartelt study. And this is a very high dimensional plot. Okay, there's a lot of information here. So you can see we've color coded the different clusters. Okay. Um, and I have to use a legend to remind myself because there's so much going on here. But the letters uh, represent the intrinsic dynamics that we put at each node uh, in the network. Okay, so in isolation, these pre-Botzinger complex neurons, some of them are pretty much silent. Some of them generate bursts. For those who know um, this terminology, they're square wave bursts. So they're not these ramping type events, but they're much just off and then on and then off again. Uh, and some of them actually just tonically spike. So we, we put heterogeneous dynamics using Hodgkin-Huxley type models in these neurons. Um, the shapes show you what uh, dynamics the cells actually exhibited once we coupled the, ne the network together. Right? So we have the intrinsic dynamics and the coupled network dynamics, which could be two different things. Uh, the sizes show you the between the centrality of each of these nodes, okay? And so I thought I had this really nice idea, um, which is, you know, this is the real network, right? So this, somehow this has to generate synchronized bursts, but it doesn't look like it should work, right? Because this cave is going to, you know, um, decide that they like classical music, right? This cave is going to decide that they like country music and no, 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 trend is going to be able to take over the whole network. Um, so my cool idea was, OK, at these communicator hubs between the caves, you have to put some sort of special dynamics. Because I'm a strong believer that actually not just connectivity, but dynamics matters. I've seen it in many systems. Right? So if I put the right dynamics at these, at these communicator hubs, we're going to get the right dynamics from the whole network. It just it had to work. OK, so we ran a lot of simulations. It was a little bit of hard work. Right? We've got these Hodgkin-Huxley networks that take a long time to simulate. Um, it's 2011. Um, we want to um, quantify how bursty the output is and how synchronized everything is. So all of that was actually a bit non-trivial. Um, we came up with this scoring system, like a network burst index that took into account all sorts of different factors in the dynamics to, 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 sc to score this success at synchronized bursting. Um, so we had to filter the signals and kind of, you know, this is a cartoon, right, but turn them into these more easily analyzable uh, step functions. And then we looked at sort of the variance in, in when they were going up and down and, and all sorts of factors like that to come up with this score, okay? Um, I can go into more details on that later if you like. Um, 
And here are the results. Okay, so what we did was we built a lot of different networks. This is probably too small for many of you to see, but we have NN, which is our shorthand for like a lattice type network, nearest neighbor. We have classic small world. We have an, an, another variation on small world that we made up. Um, pure Erdos Reni. Um, right, sorry, lattice is here. This is NN is just true nearest neighbor, like on a ring. Uh, scale free networks, we had a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and then we simulated this type of thing on all of them. Okay, and, and in every measure we could come up with, the two worst performers were the, the network that basically just had really local ring connections, because it's just not good at synchronizing, and the Hartelt network. Okay, and then we did my special experiment, right, and we seeded, we ranked between the centrality of all the nodes, we seeded different types of dynamics at the, the different nodes, depending on you know, how, how central they were, and it just made no difference. Okay. That, the connectome here is trumping the, I guess, <laughs> um, is defeating the, um, the, yeah, I, I lost my train of thought there with my bad word choice. In any case, it didn't work. Um, random, random connections, or, you know, random placement of the intrinsic dynamics is just as good as any special placement. Okay. Um, so, quick question. I yeah. just, what, what is the special dynamics? Yeah, so, so again, um, I didn't emphasize this a whole lot, but pre Botzinger neurons in isolation, and this is just, you know, rough, in rough terms, kind of can be just isol you know, unspiking or just rarely spiking, so that's a quiescent state. They can fire these nice square wave bursts, some of them just on their own if you block the synapses or some of them are tonic. They just happily spike along. Okay, so we have this Hodgkin-Huxley model that we can tune. It's been designed to model this type of neuron, so it can be tuned to, to go in any of these three states by like varying the leak reversal or something like that. And so, I, so yeah, we, we put you know, the observed proportions, roughly speaking, in the network of these three types. And in the random case, we just place them randomly and say like in the QBT case, I put the Q dynamics at the top one third of nodes in terms of between the centrality. I put the B in the middle one third and the T is in the bottom one third. No difference, yeah. Okay, all right. So then we have to ask, okay, uh, we've learned something, so why did this fail? Um, so one possibility is that this dynamic, this, this model was too naive, not sophisticated enough. Okay, we used a classic model, okay, but there have been ma many more models since then. Some of them I had already worked on even before this project, and others have come out since. So this only captures a limited amount of the dynamics. Maybe that's the problem. Another possibility is this one, okay? And so I had this um, <laughs> interesting moment where I presented actually that work at this, um, it's called the Oxford Conference, because it started in Oxford. It's a once every two to three year uh, sort of big conference on modeling and, it's called the Oxford Conference on Modeling and Control of Respiration, even though in practice, there's usually like three of us who are modelers and everybody else who's a biologist who sort of maybe doesn't show up during the, <laughs> the modeling talks. Well, that's not really fair, that's not true. But um, there's, there, it's, it's not really, um, it's a biology meeting, but they, they, they allowed me to speak, and I presented this, and I had like six different people come up individually to me afterwards and say, you know, it's organotypic culture, you can't trust that data at all. So apparently in the culture, um, because of the way it's done, connections can grow and die after the culture is made and before the analysis is done. Okay, so, um, I would say our computational study is more evidence in that favor that this is not the true connection pattern. John, just a hypothesis. Just a quick, because the question came up for Sandro asked the question, I was just quickly checking. It looks like he said some data from some Danish group that the culture thing does give you the right dynamics, but with different time constants or different burst durations, but it's still so, I don't know. So maybe it's not totally off. These are just hypotheses. And I'd actually, yeah, it would be fun to discuss that. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll come back to the caveman network and other network stuff in a minute, um, but I wanted to switch over to a success story. 
um, or what I view as more of a success story that we worked on more recently uh, before trying to you know, return back to the connectivity. And there's a reason for this, this organization in the talk. Um, okay, so um, building on the work with the burstlet theory, um, Ryan Phillips and I decided we wanted to actually build a model that would put this conceptual idea you know, to the test and, and actually try to bring it to life. Okay, so we have our rhythm generator neurons. And so again, these have this sort of Hodgkin-Huxley dynamics. Um, let's see, do I, yeah, which can produce, for example, this square wave bursting pattern. If we tune things appropriately, this is voltage versus time. Um, and then we have um, another factor in the neurons, which is that these neurons have, shown, um, to, have been shown to have calcium-induced calcium release. So they have these intracellular stores of calcium, okay? And if calcium comes into the cell, then um, it can, in fact, induce release of calcium from these stores. So you can get this positive feedback effect, okay? Now, it's not necessary to completely segregate into this type of neuron and this type of neuron. Okay, we can have each of these mechanisms present to different extents in different neurons, but just for this starting point, let's say we have a, this rhythm generator and this, this other guy who doesn't have the burst capability but has this calcium-induced calcium release. Okay, so we built these models, you wire them up, and it behaves very nicely. Okay, so each time there's a burst here, we get an input of calcium into the postsynaptic cell partly through synaptic currents and partly through a calcium, voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, the calcium inside the cell, uh, inside the ER, accumulates. Eventually, there's this big release event, and the time scales are right, and the, the size of this event is right, that it generates a burst response in this otherwise non-bursty neuron. Okay, so the calcium release actually allows it to burst. Okay, so... Uh, if we put this together, uh, we can vary uh, the fraction of the synaptic current that's carried by calcium. We can vary how quickly this rhythm generator cell is, is bursting. Okay, and then we can see different degrees of entrainment from complete entrainment, so a red burst on every blue burst, to basically a complete failure to entrain down here um, as we vary these parameters. So at least at the two cell level, this mechanism works really well to give you a possible recruitment of the non-burster cell. Okay, and so sure enough, uh, we built this into two networks. Okay, so we have a rhythm generator network um, where the bursting ability is not necessarily tuned to be there in every cell, but the burst supporting currents are dominant in these cells. And over here, we have this calcium-induced calcium release is dominant, okay? We, we kept the connectivities um, to match what it, the, the, the other experimental observation that's out there, which is that the overall average connectivity in this, in this pre-bot network is about 13%. Um, that, that's an estimate. I'm not, not necessarily exact, but... Um, so we, we varied these different connectivities in a hand-tuned manner to sort of best match what we'd seen experimentally and while maintaining this overall connectivity. And just for fun, we decided to, to keep this at 13% as well, the connectivity within the rhythm generator since we have several degrees of freedom here. So the connectivity within the rhythm generator population is 13%. And these are, these are just random networks, no, no caves, okay? And sure enough, right, as we vary the extracellular potassium concentration, I, I forgot to put that on here, but uh, we get this gradual recruitment uh, happening more and more successfully. Okay, and you can see that here. So these are the four <coughs> simulations we're showing, the burstlet fraction, uh, and we have data from the CAM work um, here uh, versus the KBATH. Uh, and then when we simulate, we see um, during failures, so burstlets and bursts, we basically get the same um, mean population potential. So they're indistinguishable initially. Uh, only the bursts generate the simulated, you know, sort of population motor neuron output. 
Okay, so this works, uh, I would claim, to generate the sort of burstlet to burst transition. Yeah, yeah so k bath is this um, sort of artificial parameter, right? It's, it's something that gets tuned experimentally. Um, there have been recordings done in various um, potassium concentrations in like the bath solution that's applied uh, on, on a brain slice here, or actually, uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember if this is slice or this perfused prep, but either way, there's like a bath solution. Um, okay, so um, great. So uh, I want to highlight one other thing because it's going to be relevant in the comparison to some other work, which is this, okay? So remember those uncaging experiments I mentioned back at near the beginning of the talk when they use light to release glutamate targeting specific individual cells, okay? And depending how many cells they targeted and when, they either succeeded or failed to evoke a burst. Um, so our network does this as well. Okay, so remember the red are these sort of what I call pattern formation or follower neurons. The blue are the rhythm generators. Okay, and we pick different numbers of cells at random uniformly from the whole population to effectively, you know, act as though we have released glutamate there. And we give them a glutamate puff in, in our simulations and we watch what happens in the rest of the network. Okay, and here's an example where we did this to five neurons and it failed to transform into a network event. And here's an example where we did this to nine neurons and it succeeded. So the burst would have happened here, but instead we evoked it to happen earlier. Okay, and the one other piece of data here uh, is how much time it takes, right? There's the probability of success, which depends on how many neurons we stimulate and how long we, we wait until after the previous burst to stimulate them. So with more neurons stimulated, we can succeed with an earlier seeding uh, sooner after the previous burst uh, with a higher probability of the time, uh, you know, higher probability of success. And then there's the other factor is the delay. So the delay from when we uncage the glutamate to when you actually get the population event, right? Here you can see it in this black box, right? The activity starts at the tips of the green arrows and then it gets delayed for some time, okay? And the delays seen experimentally were up to half a second. And that's gonna be relevant in a bit. Um, this is the blue cut, the red cut, and the black cut shown down here. Okay, so this is all, again, I don't have all the experimental data here, but this is all a sign of success of this model, that it's, that it's behaving the correct way in these measures. Okay, all right, so now back to the connections. Um, oh, sorry, just to sum that up, um, the recipe for burstlets and bursts that we see is we have a subpopulation that generates bursts, uh, we then have that population using calcium-induced calcium release to recruit the rest of the neurons into a successful burst. Okay, so what I haven't told you in this story and is not in this paper is how does this happen, right? This was the original topic of the caveman study, right? How does this rhythm generating population manage to synchronize and successfully generate bursts over and over and over again like this? Right. There, this doesn't show the ramping either, which seems to be important. So we still have to go back to this. Okay, all right. Um, so let's focus on this network alone, okay? So what architecture could we have in this network to give us synchronized bursting? And again, this is back to this connectomics question. All right, so there's one other study, a nice paper that came out last year. Um, where they did some simulations like this. They built their own various networks, okay? And they considered what they, four different types of networks, okay? Um, and one is just your classic random network. And another is small world, and you can see the color code is number of connections. Uh, localized, right, so you 
connect nearby. This is kind of like our nearest neighbor failure type, you know, network that performed really poorly in our simulations. And then hierarchical um, has a certain layering aspect to it. And to be frank, I don't remember the full details of what the hierarchical definition was uh, at this moment. But um, it was another class that's distinct from these three. Okay. They uh, wanted to run simulations to look at the spread of activity in these networks. So they put low, leaky integrating fire dynamics at all the nodes, which you know, allows you to simulate quickly, which is nice. Um, and they really focused on these holographic experiments. So that's part of the reason I wanted to focus on that earlier in the talk. So they really use these experiments as a key determinant of the performance of their different simulated networks. Okay. So it's a long paper, you know, Jay Nurisai allows plenty of figures, and I just want to focus on sort of this key um, <laughs> figure extracted from the paper. There's lots of panels, but it ends up being easy to digest once I give you some guideposts. Okay, and this was the big conclusion of their paper, okay? Um, so only the erdos renyi networks with a log normal weight distribution match the experiments um, on getting this burst to burst, sorry, burst lit to burst transformation right with the holographic uncaging. Okay, so up until now I haven't said anything about the weight distribution, right? It's just whether the connections are there or not. But that was a new factor that they brought in. Okay, and so again, this is one of the key figures I would say in the paper. Um, so the, maybe this is a couple of figures put together. You've got your four different uh, network classes compared. Obviously, there's a lot of degrees of freedom. Like if I told you all a homework assignment, go code up a localized network, um, and gave you a few more details, you would still generate, you know, like 40 different networks, I believe. So there's details here that presumably could have mattered. But um, in any case, the finding here is uh, you can see each one of these neuron classes is a little bit different in terms of the path length, uh, average path length and average clustering coefficient in the network. They were all standardized to have the same um, measure of, of neuronal degree, and uh, actually this bar doesn't show you much, right, because different neurons will have different degree. So um, I just want you to take away that these bars are all the same, which is going to signify that they have the same, they're, they're balanced in terms of degree. Um, and the point is they did this holographic uncaging simulation, so they stimulated different number of neurons, and they looked at the probability of getting a successful synchronization event, which means the whole network lights up within some temporal proximity of each other. Um, and uh, the time from the stimulation until that event. And the gray shaded boxes are supposed to represent what was seen in the experiments. Now, if you really are careful about what was seen in the experiments, you wouldn't just have a rectangle, but again, let's not worry about details too much. Okay, and the point is, in this network, in this network, in this network, right, there's very little overlap in the simulated results and these gray boxes. Whereas in this network with the log normal weight distribution, there's very strong overlap. Um, and so the prediction coming out of this is that this could be a nice candidate architecture for what's present in this network. Did they consider the log normal weight distribution on the other architectures as well? Um, yeah, that's a good question. One, so One could ask if the weight distributions is really mattering. Right, yeah, um, they must have. There's a lot of stuff in the paper and it w wouldn't make sense not to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay, so, um, great. So that's the result here, right? Um, so it's far from a mathematical proof, right? Like this is what our students want to do in the intro to proof case. Like say, look, I tried these four cases they all fail, therefore the result is false. Or these four all work, therefore the result is true. Right? But nonetheless, they did a lot of work and saw that it's non-trivial to get agreement with the experiments, and this is a network that actually does agree, so maybe it's one worth considering more. It's also not a ridiculous one to propose as a neuronal you know, coupling architecture. All right, so the thing is, I, I misspoke earlier. I, I, I've I realize my logic in this presentation is off by a tweak. Um, right, so 
really I shouldn't put the RG network because what they're trying to capture is the whole network, right? Because they want to have the burstlet capability and the burst capability. And you need the whole populations, right? You need the rhythm generator and the pattern formation in my earlier notation to get that, okay? And so that we got um, without log normal synaptic weights, right? Just using two populations, which they didn't consider that maybe there's this heterogeneity in, in the connectivity where it's not just the same pattern throughout all 500 or whatever neurons, right? So although this is plausible, it's certainly not the only solution, okay? So what's my timing now? Um, you have 10 plus 10. Plus. Okay, perfect. So I just want to spend a few minutes um, basically telling you where we are now, right? This is a workshop, and so um, this is work very much in progress, um, but, whoops, I don't know what happened. Oops. <laughs> All right, let's do an experiment. Oh, good. All right, so all of this has been, you know, very much simulations, right? And, you know, I'm in a math department, but I also uh, can do what I want, right? So I'm happy doing simulations some of the time. And more and more, the more I talk to biologists and they tell me this matters and this matters, right, the more simulations I end up doing. But nonetheless, like, I don't want to just do that. And it would be nice to have a mathematical analysis, right, rather than saying, okay, let's simulate this, 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 right? You can never do that exhaustively. So um, we're in the process of trying to develop a framework that I just made as pared down as possible to try to just totally focus on the connectivity. And so I just want to comment on a few things on this and however time goes, it goes. Um, but yeah, so to start with, I want to show you this movie that I've been saving, right? Because probably you're tired, hungry, so we need a movie. All right, so this is calcium imaging from my close collaborator, Jeff Smith, who unfortunately retired. This is pre-bots, and you're seeing little sparks of activity, and eventually they sort of may die out like that one, or they might accumulate into the burst. And so I kind of think of the burst as when everything turns red. And this is spontaneous. There's no uncaging or anything. Um, this is a different form of imaging, full stop. <laughs> uh, you can hear the neurons nicely if you're close enough to my computer, I guess. Eventually, we're going to go back to the color pictures. And let's just let that happen. And this is still cultured? Or this is uh... So this is, yeah, this is slice. Slice. Yeah. All right, so this is what we're after, right? <laughs> this is what we want our network to do. And here's a few snapshots. Okay, so when you go slower, frame by frame, right, you kind of see some certain stages where there's little sparks. Eventually, there's enough sparking and maybe a few concentrations of calcium that I think of as localized bursting, and then you really get a nice bursting event. Okay, so in my view, um, this reminds me of something called bootstrap percolation. Okay, so bootstrap percolation is dynamics on a graph. All right, so suppose we have a graph. This is classic bootstrap percolation. A graph, it's vertices and edges, and we assign states to the vertices. And this is really simple, okay? Every vertex is either a zero inactive or one active, okay? And then we're going to have discrete time dynamics. So on every time step, we update the state of every node. Okay, and the update rule is just going to be what's called a K threshold update. All right, so I've put this in mathematical notation, but all it says is if you have inputs, if you have connections to at least K neighbors who are in the active state, then you go into the active state. Okay, and in the classic, like the simplest form, it's monotone. So you never go back from active to inactive, not like neurons, but starting as simple as possible. Okay, so yeah, we have connections, and in standard bootstrap percolation, it's underacted, so EIJ is equal to EJI, right? I connects to J, it's, it's not directional. Okay, and there's lots of actually fairly, um, what I would consider intense mathematical analysis going behind calculating, estimating what's called the critical probability, 
for different classes of graphs as a function of the threshold and the number of nodes in the graph. Okay, and so the critical probability is the um, connection probability, with some measure of connectivity, at which there is a 50% chance that the network will successfully fully activate, and 50% chance it will not. So that's the criticality. Just, just as a note, especially since you mentioned this is still in progress, there are closely related models with different names that have been developed very richly in network science on the social science side. Yes. It's still looking at things. Yes, yes, it's yes. Already yes. on your radar. So, so I'm not it's... actually doing BP. Okay. okay. No, as long, as long as it's on your radar. <laughs> and it's I definitely can... on my radar. And there's, there's all sorts right. of variations, right. Right. right, because you can have probabilistic right. Right. coupling. Right. Uh, I know there's another name for this. Watch mm -hmm. threshold model and things like that. Yeah. But, but yes, there's, okay. as long, yes. As long as, long as it's on your radar. Yeah, and. I was just playing with uh, like game of life. Right. So yeah. sometimes people think of this as, you know, like an agent-based framework. Yeah. All right. So What's that's. What are X and H? Ah, so sorry. H is a heavy side step function. And X is my mistake because I um, changed my notation from X to S, but it looks like I missed a spot. So X and S are the same. Sorry. All right, so uh, in case I lost you, I mean, this is what it looks like, right? We have undirected graphs. Uh, say the threshold was two and these three are active, right? This guy has three active neighbors, so he becomes active. Uh, these guys do not have three active neighbors, so they stay inactive, full stop. Okay, so again, based on the movies and recordings, we have this ramping activity in the neurons that are going to generate the E to I transition. So to me, this is a three-state process. Okay, so now we're into multi-state bootstrap percolation where multi here is gonna mean three. Okay, so we have three states, now inactive, weakly active, which is like the sporadic activity or you know ramping into the burst, and then we have our fully active burst. Okay, and when neurons are bursting, they put out more synaptic output than when they're not. So we increase the output strength to some value W, that's bigger than one, the output level for the tonic spiking regime when the neurons are in the bursting regime. So we're gonna go away from standard bootstrap percolation, we're gonna deal with three-state bootstrap percolation on directed graphs because neurons have directed synapses. Okay, I'm almost out of time. So this is what we're doing now, okay? Mathematically, no typos on this one, no X. Um, yes. Um, this is what it looks like, but this is what you can more quickly digest perhaps, right? Graphically, we have the inactive state. Um, inactive can maybe spread if the threshold were just one to these uh, partner nodes since they both project to this guy. This guy will become fully active if the threshold for that is two, and then that'll spread full activity to the full network. Here's a more complicated graph where with these two initially active nodes, right, just the two-state percolation would die out because at this stage there's nobody else. These two guys do not get input from two active neighbors. But with three-state percolation, you can actually spread the activity to the whole network. Okay? So, um, yeah. So basically what we're doing now is starting to study this as a way to compare different connectivities uh, and how they perform in this regime and see what we can prove about um, that relationship, right? And so we have established to our satisfaction, both through some analysis and simulations, here's a simple simulation, that these don't just give you the same result, right? I showed you one little example here where they don't give you the same result, but systematically they don't give you the same result, you know, bootstrap percolation and multi-state uh, bootstrap percolation. So we this could actually help us start to get at the purpose of even having bursts, right? To spread the activity more effectively and, and achieve more, more complete synchrony. And so to end, I just wanna mention, we've done a couple of things with this. Um, one is like a mean field attempt, even though we're far, far from the end goes to infinity limit. Um, uh, another is to try to define a good measure of synchrony efficiency 
and figure out what sort of architectures would be mathematically predicted to have efficient synchronization. Um, so that's a couple of things. Um, here, let me just show you this. This is worth giving up a minute of question time, I think. These are simulations of the three-state process on a erdos net. Oh, sorry, on a random regular graph. Everybody has the same in and out degree, and on a torus. So localized kind of connections. And these give you very different spreading patterns. So this is an example of how we can kind of start to use this process to maybe distinguish between different types of architectures and how well they can generate synchronized, fully active states. All right, so I'm gonna skip this stuff. Um, yeah, this is the synchrony efficiency I mentioned, a little theorem, a little bit of mean field stuff um, with some phase planes, and then we're gonna, you know, we have data based on the holographic uncaging and some ablation experiments that we're trying to connect with this work eventually. So. Um, that's all there, but I'm just gonna go to the conclusions here. Okay, all right. So, um, David, I had your name on one of my slides, but I think I rushed right past it. I think the point is the caveman network looks a lot like your poster, uh, but we're very far from n goes to infinity. So maybe you can tell me later if you can tell me anything about conditions under which the caveman network would synchronize based on your theory. But in terms of my conclusions in the meantime, um, this is what we've learned, among other things. I didn't show you much about persistent sodium or the can current, but calcium-induced calcium release is probably really important in how we breathe, so um, that's one thing. Um, we're working on our pre-bot connectome, um, which is not the whole brain type connectome, but what I talked about here. I would claim it's unlikely to be a caveman network, um, we showed some evidence that I like, that it could be a sort of an, a heterogeneous type of coupling pattern um, broken down into some subpopulations. And we have this new framework we're starting to get into. And Mason, I'm glad to compare notes on that. That's a little different from some of the other things out there. So very glad to compare notes on that with you and other experts in this area afterwards. Um, and yeah, I didn't say anything about putting these two together, really. So I thank my collaborators, and I'll be happy to take questions.